this has nothing to do with exercise in the traditional form. And yet 800 to 2,500 calories per day, that's a considerable amount of fat oxidized. How many calories you ingest versus how many calories you burn is the fundamental and most important formula in this business of fat loss and weight management in general. There's simply no way around the fact that if you ingest far more calories than you burn, you're likely to gain weight. And a good portion of that weight is likely to be adipose tissue, fat. It's also true that if you ingest fewer calories than you burn, that you will lose weight and that a significant portion of that will come from body fat. What portion depends on a number of factors, but that simple formula is important. The calories burned portion is strongly influenced by a number of things that you can control that can greatly accelerate or increase the amount of adipose tissue or the proportion of adipose tissue that you burn in response to exercise and food. So your hormones are important. Your thermogenic milieu, meaning how warm or how cold your body is, but also your level of metabolism, your levels of thyroid hormone, and something that's hardly ever discussed, but is well supported by the scientific literature, how much connectivity there is between your nervous system and fat. If your foundation of health and your foundation of hormones and your foundation of metabolism isn't right, it's going to be very hard to get the most out of any kind of exercise or fat loss protocol. Get your sleep right. Get your light exposure right. Avoid bright light in your eyes at times you want to be asleep and get bright light in your eyes at times you want to be awake. The other thing is essential fatty acids. We need fatty acids. They are vital to so many aspects of our health. You don't have to get them from supplements. You can if you want to, but you need to get them from your food. They are essential. Of the fatty acids, there are multiple kinds. The levels of fatty acids that will promote good mood and also healthy metabolism and will start to shift the needle in the right direction on bloodborne cardiovascular factors. The key thing is to get the levels of EPA that you ingest above 1,000 milligrams per day. That, of course, can be done through food sources, things like fatty fish, or if you're not into eating fish, you have quality meats that are grass-raised can do that because that's when you can best support your metabolism and position yourself for good fat loss. And then finally, you can't really position yourself to have a strong metabolism if your iodine levels aren't correct and your thyroid levels aren't correct. You can overdo iodine, so you don't want to do that. A lot of table salt has iodine added to it, but some people need to add iodine they, by ingesting things like kelp, etc. But one of the best ways to support the thyroid system and metabolism in general is to make sure you're getting enough selenium, sometimes called selenium, each day. Simple way to do that is to ingest the highest concentration of selenium food that I'm aware of, which is Brazil nuts. One or two or three of those per day, you'll have more than enough selenium to meet the thyroid needs. You don't want your selenium to be too high. You don't want a diet too high in anything. Let's talk about how fat is converted into energy, which is sometimes also called fat burning. There's two parts to this process. One is fat mobilization, and the second is fat oxidation or utilization, okay? So the first thing that has to happen for body fat to get burned up or used and reduced is that it has to get mobilized. You just have to move that fat out of the position that it's in. You have to get it out of the fat cells, all right? Fat cells can be visceral around our viscera, our organs, or they can be subcutaneous under our skin. Basically, stored fat has two parts that are relevant here. It's got the fatty acid part, and that's the part that your body can use, and that's attached to something called glycerol, and they're linked by a backbone. To mobilize fat, you got to break the backbone between glycerol and these fatty acids, okay? And that second part is oxidation, is then those fatty acids, those are potential fuel, but you haven't burned the fat yet. You've just moved it out of your fat cells. They're going to go into cells that can use them for energy. And once they are inside those cells, they're still not burned up. You need to oxidize them. You think oxidation is the burn up part. They need to be moved into the mitochondria and then they can be converted into ATP, into energy. So one of the most powerful ways to stimulate epinephrine, which is also called adrenaline, from these neurons that connect to fat and to thereby stimulate more fat mobilization and oxidation is through movement. But I'm not talking about exercise. The type of movement that I'm referring to is extremely subtle, which is that shiver or shivering 
is a strong stimulus for the release of adrenaline into fat and the increase in fat oxidation and mobilization. But shiver is not just induced by cold, and there are other subtle forms of movement that can greatly increase fat metabolism and fat loss. There was a group in England during the 1960s and 70s that discovered a pathway by which subtle forms of movement can greatly increase fat loss. What they did was they examined people who overate and did not gain weight. And what they observed was that those people engaged in lots of subtle movement throughout the day. In other words, they were fidgeters. And in fact, many people who had low levels of body fat had a lot of resting tremor, not of the Parkinsonian type, but they would bounce their knee while they were sitting. When they would talk, they would engage in very angular movements. They were sort of electric fidgeters, burn anywhere from 800 to 2,500 calories more than the control group in the experiments that they looked at. And indeed, there's been a modern look into all this, and these numbers check out. It seems to work best in people who are already slightly overweight. So for people that are overweight, who are kind of averse to exercise, fidgeting might actually be a good entry point. Fat is controlled by these neurons and the epinephrine they release. You might say, well, how could these little micro movements lead to so much caloric burn? These little fidgety movements, the engagement of certain aspects of our musculature that are nothing like exercise, those low level movements, they trigger epinephrine release from these neurons and they stimulate the mobilization of fat. And then that fat is oxidized at higher rates. This has nothing to do with exercise in the traditional form. And yet 800 to 2,500 calories per day, that's a considerable amount of fat oxidized. Now it should make sense why shivering is one of the strongest stimuli that one can incorporate to stimulate fat loss. Now shivering is almost always associated with cold. And there are two ways that shivering can increase fat loss. And there are several ways that you can use shivering, you can leverage shivering, and you can leverage cold to accelerate fat loss, but you have to do it correctly. We have several kinds of fat. White fat is the type that we traditionally think of as fat, subcutaneous fat, and it is not particularly rich in mitochondria. It is there as an energy storage site, and we have to mobilize the fat out, as we talked about before, and burn it up elsewhere. Brown fat largely exists between our shoulder blades and on the back of our neck, and it's rich with mitochondria, which is why it's called brown fat. And brown fat has a particular biochemical cascade whereby it can take food, basically, break it down, and convert it into energy within those cells. Unlike fatty acids from white fat, which have to travel elsewhere, get broken down in mitochondria and, and convert into ATP, etc., brown fat is thermogenic. It can actually use energy directly. It skips a step. Beige fat is sort of in between. It's white fat that could be brown fat because it has some mitochondria in it, but not as many as brown fat. The big effects of cold on metabolism and fat burning are going to be through two routes. One is that if you expose yourself to cold, you have the opportunity to trigger activation of brown fat as well as to convert more beige fat into true brown fat. So you essentially create a stronger or a hotter furnace. That's the way to think about brown fat. It's like a furnace. What you're doing is you're increasing the burn of energy by increasing the intensity of the heat inside you, so to speak. When you get into cold and you shiver, that low level movement of the muscle triggers the release of a molecule called succinate. And succinate acts on the brown fat to increase brown fat thermogenesis and fat burning overall. It actually increases body heat through this brown fat thermogenesis pathway. And it also over time can increase the amount of brown fat by converting beige fat into true brown fat. So first let's talk about how long to get into that cold environment. Most of you might think, oh, well, if one minute is good, three minutes is better. And if three minutes is better then 10 minutes is best. But remember the goal is to get the shiver induced release of succinate so that succinate can trigger the brown fat. It turns out that if you want to trigger the shiver, what you want to do is to get into the cold and then get out of the cold 
and typically not dry off and then get back into the cold and out of the cold. That will definitely stimulate more shivering than just getting into the cold itself. So what I'm not referring to is getting into the cold environment like an ice bath and waiting until you shiver and staying there shivering. You also don't want to get hypothermic and I want to be clear, you want to get approval from your doctor before you do any of this. Here's a potential kind of sets reps protocol that you can play with. Find a temperature that induces shiver for you. That's going to vary depending on your cold tolerance and how cold adapted you are. One to three, maybe five times a week. Get in or get under the shower or whatever it is until you start to shiver, genuinely shiver. Then after about a minute or so, get out. Spend one to three minutes out, but don't dry off. Get back in for anywhere from one to three minutes, but try and access the shiver point again. And you might do three repetitions of that. So it's three times in and three times out total. That's a great starting place. If you become cold adapted, you're not going to get the fat burning effects to the same degree. So cold is a powerful tool for fat loss, but you don't want to adapt. If you're quickly moving from 30 seconds of exposure to 10 minutes of exposure, you're overlooking the opportunity to get the most fat loss and increase in metabolism by stepping it up in smaller increments. Okay. And this also speaks to the rationale for using cold exposure to accelerate fat loss for certain periods, but then maybe not doing it year round. If fat loss is your goal, maybe use it for two, three months at a time and then stop for two, three months at a time because it is such a potent stimulus provided you engage in the shiver.